Hey, this is Anthony Green, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith, and we are back with a brand new episode. And you're going to love this one, folks. Today on the show, Maddie Mullins of Memphis May Fire. They've got a new album out, Remade in Misery. The album is great. The band is great. And this conversation is great. We cover it all. The history of the band, Maddie's move to Texas, their evolution and sound over the years, the ups and downs of the band, life on the road, strap in, that's coming up momentarily. Okay, so on to some business. Folks, support the new scene. You can support us by following us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. If you haven't followed us yet, do it. There's different content on every platform. There's something for everybody. Also, subscribe to us on YouTube. We have a main channel with full episodes and a clips channel with highlights from our favorite episodes. And, folks, I am proud to announce that the new scene now has a brand new gaming channel. That's right. The new scene gaming is a new channel on YouTube. I will be uploading gaming content on that YouTube channel. It's out there. It's linked via our other YouTube channels. Give it a follow. I have uploaded a video of my first Caldera win from Warzone. Go check it out. If you're into gaming, if you're into me playing games, you'll love it. We have a shirt for sale. The new scene, Life is Music is Life shirt, is available at Deathwish Inc. Head on over to the store at Deathwish Inc. Search the new scene. The shirt will pop right up. Your purchase of that shirt helps directly fund this show, and we thank everybody who has purchased a shirt. Reviews. Now, folks, I still need reviews. We're hanging at 79 on Apple and 78 on Spotify, and I've got to get us over 100, and I am not going to stop begging you until we get there. Open up your Apple Podcast or Spotify application, hit that five-star button, give us a five-star review if you haven't done it yet. Please just do it and write a nice review on Apple Podcasts and I'll read it on the air. Also support Iodine Recordings. Here's some news. Saves the Day are playing three gigs where they will be performing their album, Stay What You Are, in its entirety. And Iodine's own Her Heads on Fire are direct support for all three shows. Two are at Starland Ballroom in Sayreville, New Jersey, and one is in Anaheim, California at House of Blues. If you haven't heard Her Heads on Fire, check them out. I've seen them. I've heard them. I love them. And you got to go to one of these shows. Tickets are available via Saves the Day and Her Heads on Fire social media. Go check it out. Get advanced tickets. These are definitely going to sell out. And in music news, our friends in Mall Walker, who appeared on episode 83 of this podcast last year in October, their debut self-titled EP has been picked up by Better Days Will Haunt You, and it's going to get a vinyl release. So it's out there now. It's on Bandcamp. It's on streaming services. Go check it out if you have not heard it yet. It is wonderful, great summertime music. And the band also features our friend and new scene guest, Corey Brim from Glassing. So you just can't go wrong with this band. I'm back. I've been listening to the EP a lot again. My favorite song right now is... Don't park at the porn shop. Check it out. Check it out. And the boys in Mall Walker also have a band called Easy Prey. It's a heavier, noisy, hardcore, and it's very, very good. They've got a new record coming out called Unrest, and that's dropping August 19th on Hell Minded Records. If you haven't heard the band yet and you're in the mood for something heavy, listen to it. It's great. It's great stuff. Okay, so check back in with me at segment three. I'll talk about how I'm doing. I'll talk about the gaming YouTube channel some more. We'll catch up. We'll see what's going on. But folks, right now, we are going to speak to Maddie Mullins of Memphis May Fire. Enjoy. 
All right, folks, we're here now with Maddie Mullins. Maddie, welcome to the show. Hey, Key, thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. It's wonderful to have you here, Maddie. You know, there's a lot going on in your life right now. We've got Remade in Misery, the new album from Memphis May Fire out right now. And there's plenty going on, and we're going to get to all of that. But first, Maddie, let me ask you, how are you doing today? Doing good. Yeah, yeah. Today's been a good day. We had rehearsal a couple hours ago, and um, my sister, Katie, who lives in Spokane, is in town here in Nashville. And so I'm going to take her out for dinner tonight and uh, just trying to soak up these last couple of days at home before we hit the road. Now, when do you leave for tour? On Thursday. And how long will this tour be? Where Where is it going? Uh, it's a full US. I think it's going to be about a month and a half. Oh, yeah. So you got to get that time in. I mean, that's a long time away from home. Yeah, man. Yeah. And we, we definitely value our time at home and, and we love being on the road at well, as well. So just try to make the most of both. When is the last time you toured before this upcoming one? Uh, we just finished a tour last month uh, with Dance Gavin Dance. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you're, it's not like uh, it's been multiple years or you're, you know, it's been a long time. You're, you're just in it right now. Yeah. No, our first one back was, uh, was with Breaking Benjamin and uh, Papa Roach. And that was um, probably a year ago, something like that. That's quite a massive tour back. What was that like? That must have been unbelievable. It was wild, man. It was our first time touring in arenas, like outside of festivals, obviously, just like on an actual package, you know? And it was uh, it was unreal. <laughs> I love all those guys too. Like the guys from Breaking Band, the guys from Papa Roach are all just awesome people. So it the, everything about it was awesome. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, what is it like playing shows that massive. I mean, you're used to big crowds anyway with your band, but I imagine uh, with that tour package, it's even bigger. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it looks, it looks crazy. Like, especially once, once an arena is full, sometimes a crowd can just like, you get lost in playing. And so the crowd just, it feels like a crowd. It doesn't, it's not like, oh my gosh, this must be what Justin Bieber feels like. You know what I mean? But like, yeah, but when you're sound checking and just looking at an empty arena, it's crazy. Like it, it's, <laughs> it's insane to be like, man, just like the, the people that have been here and, and I can't believe that somehow I'm here. It's, it's awesome. And, you know, I've experienced on this on a much, much, much smaller scale, but you know, like watching a group of people just pummel each other to a song I wrote is the best feeling in the world. I mean, when you see a crowd that big reacting to songs that you and the band wrote together. It's got to be the best feeling in the world. It's crazy, man. Yeah, it really is. Especially like with this newer stuff and, and how well it's doing, um, you know, playing the new songs live and, and having them not have been out for very long and seeing the response was unreal. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to talk about Remade and Misery. I love the record, by the way. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. I was listening to it again today and I'm going to get there, but you know what? Let's get to know you a little bit first, Maddie. You grew up in Spokane. Yeah. Spokane, Washington, born and raised, grew up there and went to high school there, met my wife in high school and uh, we got married at 18 and uh, Memphis took off in, in like 2019. That's when we moved to Dallas and I joined the band and, and the rest is history. So you got married at 18. Got married at 18. Yeah. Just like a, a month after graduating from high school. And you're still married. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Props to you, man, because I was a mess until, I don't know, age 35. Yeah. <laughs> man, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say I wasn't a mess, but I mean, just growing together and, and my wife's an amazing person. So, you know, it's, it's been a, it's been nothing but a blessing and, you know, I wouldn't be who I am if, if I wasn't married. So. Oh, that's great. That's great. And you, you got a young start in music, right? Like you were, you were already performing in bands by the time you were 14 or 15 years old. Yeah, I got really, man, I was lucky. I, I, I had a buddy named Will who his dad had a band room directly across the street from, from where my dad lived. And, um, we started like skating together when we were young and just started going in there and messing around on the instruments, jamming along. And my older brother was in bands. So I just grew up around a lot of music, going to shows all the time. And, and we just started jamming and, and decided we'd start a band. And I was so young and one of our favorite local bands uh, broke up and we went to the same church that those guys went to. And we went up and we were just like, Hey, would you have any interest in jamming with us? And, and for whatever reason they said yes. And so I got to play <laughs> with some guys that were a lot older than me um, and a lot more talented, a lot more just well-versed in everything, you know, regarding the industry, they had done a lot of touring and signed a record deal and all this stuff. And so having them play with us, like it gave me real firsthand insight into the professional 
you know, aspect of music and, and what it takes to, to make it a career. And so I, I was, I was blessed, man. And, uh, we did a bunch of touring all over the Northwest and then I started a handful of other bands and, and, you know, by the time I was 19, I was in Memphis. So. Now I heard a story that you told you, this is kind of when you discovered your ability to sing, you were out, I think on a date and you did karaoke at a bowling alley. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had loved singing, you know, up to that point as well, but I didn't know that anybody would like care. I didn't necessarily love the sound of my own voice. And I was just out at karaoke. I was trying to impress a girl. And so I, I put on this like in sync song. This is way, way, way back. And I was singing along to it and everyone in the karaoke room just kind of turned their head and looked at me like, wait a minute. And I was like, what? And uh, when, it, <laughs> when it finished, when the song finished, everybody was like cheering. I was like, this is wild, you know, like, and I think that was the addiction, right? It's like, I can just do this, this thing that I love and, and it makes people happy or it makes people feel good. And that's, that's an unbelievable gift, like to, to feel that something that you have done or, or said or anything has just made somebody happy. And, and so, yeah, that's been, that's been the driving force. You know, that's the dream scenario. That's like the scenario they put in movies or, you know, whenever I walk into a new scenario, I imagine that happening in my head and it doesn't. So for you to belt out this song and everyone in the bowling alley to be into it, that must have been unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it could, <laughs> it couldn't have been that good. You know what I mean? Like I, uh, this was, you know, I was so young, uh, but I guess just compared to whoever else was in the room or had the mic before me or whatever, uh, people seem to enjoy it. And that's, I don't know, man, it's crazy. I've heard you say that you, you're you still critical of your own voice. Do you still feel like that? Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, that's I, I'd probably spend twice as long, if not three times as long, cutting vocals on a record that other singers do, right? Um, I just... I am so critical of myself and I can't even say that like, I love my own voice. Right. I just did. I, I want so badly to use melody and rhythm to explain something that I'm passionate about. And so I do that to the, my best, to the best of my ability and some people enjoy it. And that's so cool to me. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm extremely critical of my own voice. I get it. You know, I am too. I think we're all our own biggest critics, but Maddie, you can sing. And I love the versatility of Memphis May Fire. You know, it does it all. It's heavy. It's melodic. There's anthemic choruses. There's really heavy parts. I mean, so you're not just out there just screaming necessarily. You you are doing it all. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I you know I grew up listening to this band called Blindside, and and their singer did both. And I was like, well, that's awesome, right? Like, I wanna I wanna be able to do both. And and he he's so beautifully and seamlessly. His name's Christian. Just it goes in and out of singing and screaming and, and just makes this incredibly powerful sonic experience. And I wanted to do the same thing. So I'm still, I'm still trying. <laughs> well, you are pulling it off, Maddie. Take it from me. Thank you, man. That's awesome. Absolutely. So you're 19 years old. Memphis Mayfire puts out the word that they need a singer and they're taking open submissions for demos. Yes. Via MySpace. Ah, yes. So how does that work? Do you actually send the track through MySpace or did you have to mail a physical copy? I think I emailed it over. Um, we, I can't, honestly, it's been so long. I can't remember, but yeah, they had a, an instrumental on their MySpace that you could download and take it and record vocals over it. And so I did. And, and there was a lot of other auditions. Um, I think that was something like 180 or something like that. And a lot of guys that ended up being in other successful bands that had an audition for that band back then. It's just crazy to look back on it. Um, for whatever reason, Kellen, um, who is the only original member of the band and guitar player, really enjoyed my audition and, and asked me to come down to Texas. And so I did. And we jammed in his dad's living room because that's where they practiced. And um, it was a special moment, dude. I was I was trying to find myself. I, I, you know, I was basically, I had written to that song, but at that time their EP with their previous singer was the only thing that they had put out as a band. And so they were playing those songs live and I sang nothing like him, you know? So I was trying to emulate his thing for, for their fans and, and also kind of bring my own element to it. And it wasn't probably until, you know, we got in the studio with sleepwalking that I started to find my voice. And, and then even after that, with the between the lies EP where I really felt like I could, I could be myself completely. Right. I mean, there's going to be an adjustment period because you feel like you have to maybe do what the old person is doing. 
You don't know these guys. You move to Texas to be with them. I'm sure you have to develop a relationship and learn to work together in a band. I mean, it it's a it's a whole process. Oh man, it, it's an ongoing process. You know, that's one thing that you know. Any time someone's like, "Hey, wh- what advice do you have for someone starting a new band?" I'm just like, man, just know that internal conflict and you know personalities being so different can can put to rest something that is like so beautiful. It can end something so beautiful. And I just, I encourage people to really invest in their band members. That's something that I didn't do enough early on that I regret and, and just getting to know them and, and, and pouring your heart out and, and just really understanding each other's buttons and, and what makes someone tick, what makes someone happy, what makes them upset, you know, like those, those things are so incredibly vital to the longevity of a successful band. Yeah. It's like being in a relationship, but with, times that by however many people are in the band. And I don't know, I didn't really figure out the the mechanics of that until very recently. And when you're young, I mean, forget about it, but it sounds like, uh, sounds like it's working for you. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, like it's all of that and in small quarters, right? Like you're in a van for a long time. And, and even when you're in a bus, it's like, you still, there's 12 bunks in a tiny little space, right? It's like yeah. you, you, you know, you have to know how to coexist and I, you know, I, I would recommend this to anybody if 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 you're not into it or whatever, it's totally fine. But um, I'm a huge fan of the Enneagram. It's it's like a personality test that you know every uh, personality is its own number. So you know one through nine, and I am a and then you know every number has a, a wing number uh, where you can kind of adjust between the two. Like your, your personality does, and I'm I am a six wing seven. And th- there's this book that's called The Road Back to You, and it's all about the Enneagram. And as soon as you know what someone's number is after they take a test or whatever, and you read up on their number, you start to understand the way that the reason why they are the way they are. And in in moments of extreme stress or frustration, um, you can see the way that they feel from a completely different perspective. It's like having firsthand insight into their brain and the way it's working and why it's doing what it's doing. And and everybody feels so differently about everything like everyone is experiencing life in their own way through their own eyes and so that's really valuable information and something that i have utilized and valued so if you're talking to another person familiar with this uh, numbering system you could be like oh that's such a five moment right there and they'll be a hundred percent i mean like and i have a <laughs> lot of friends that are you know really into the enneagram as well and my wife and i are, have, have studied a lot it's really really fascinating it sounds it sounds strange but if you go and you just take the test and, and you read that book, The Road Back to You, I mean, it will give you grace for the way that people are that are ways that you aren't. It is such a phenomenal thing and uh, has taught me a lot. That sounds interesting. It sounds like that Myers-Briggs personality thing that everyone does and they're like an INRF or whatever the letters are. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with that one, but I'm sure it's a similar concept. I'm interested. I got to I got to go check this out. I want to know what number I am and what it means. Yeah, definitely. And and it will it will give you a better understanding of yourself as well. You know, I mean like I, I was raised by an anxious mother um and she's amazing but but that was part of her personality right and and that became a part of of my personality and and the enneagram 6 is um you know led by fear to a certain extent driven by fear and when i started to understand that about myself it made me realize why i was so incredibly picky about how things happened and and you know what i did and what i didn't do and what other people around me were doing that i didn't want them to do and all these kind of things that you know like just trying to be safe ultimately and and as soon as you see that then you can kind of explain that to other people too and and see that in yourself and and make a change in the areas where that's not healthy and yeah dude it's it's really fascinating it's awesome I can relate to what you're saying, especially the driven by fear thing, because I think that makes up a lot of my life. So let me ask you, Maddie, if you're driven by fear, how do you, at 19 years old, do a blind audition for a band and move across the country to perform in this band without any other backup plan? I mean, I I, I wanted to do an open audition for a band when I was young, and I never even made it to the studio. Like, how do you how do you find the courage to to make such big life affirming choices at such a young age. You know, it wasn't, uh, those were not fearful moments for me. You know, those are things that I was confident in. It was almost as if music was the only option I ever had. I I didn't ever have a backup plan and I'm not good at anything else. And I just, I had to make it happen. So that seemed like a, a no brainer to me there. I think there was more fear for me in staying in Spokane and, and not taking this opportunity than actually, you know, making this leap. 
for me, it's other things, you know, like everybody has their, their own fears and anxieties and, and, and that can be driving forces. Um, but yeah, for the, that specific situation was, it wasn't, um, it wasn't fear led for me. Oh, that's interesting. So in terms of music, you just knew, you knew this is what you're going to do. And, and you had the experience, you had already been performing for a number of years before this audition for Memphis Mayfire. Yeah, totally. And of course that, you know, I was nervous because it's people I don't know in a city I don't know with, you know, there's all those things, but it, it was, it felt like I was doing what was right. And my first show at the band and the band's first show back after losing the original singer was in front of like 6,000 people at the Plano Center. It was this big festival that uh, was happening down there. And it was mind blowing, but at the same time, it was exhilarating, like to see a music scene so big and so thriving, uh, for, for local bands. It was an incredible experience. So was that the biggest show you had ever played at that point? Oh my gosh. I mean, by a thousand, uh, by, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's crazy. My, you know, my band would, you know, we, we would, the band I was in right before that, I think, you know, we were probably worth a few hundred tickets, you know, in, in the Northwest, you know, we would travel around and, and play smaller clubs and stuff like that. But I had never, I had never experienced anything on that level ever. So was your head exploding? Mine would have been. I mean, I do this open audition for a band. I get the gig and now I'm in front of 6,000 people performing. Extremely wild. Yeah, I can't I can't even really explain it. It was, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I am, I kind of have to get in a state of like muscle memory for live performances um, just to, so that I can soak up everything that's happening around me. Like if I'm having to think too much about the song, then I'm not enjoying my environment. So we had rehearsed a lot up until that point and I did feel confident, but you know, it was, you can't, I mean, you can't explain it, you know, like people that like if someone had stage fright or whatever, it'd be the end of, it'd be the end of it for them. You know what I mean? It's like, (laughs) it looks like an ocean of people. Wow. Yeah. What, how do you feel in those moments when you're performing? Like, uh, I get really nervous before I do everything. So whether it's podcast or band or theater or any a number of other performances I've done, it's almost like I'm just in the zone. It's like I'm in it. I don't even necessarily remember all of it. You know, you're just you're just in it and you're doing it. It's kind of like that muscle memory that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you're referring to is the flow state. I mean, it's like, it has to be like that. I will get super nervous before like show number one. And then the less that I feed my nerves, the more, the the better I perform. I, I notice like I can be on stage and be thinking about a million different things, or I can just really zone in. And one thing that I've told myself every day when I walk on stage is stay in the song because my brain will just wander like crazy. So yeah, stay in the song and stay in the moment. And when I do that, there's never any issues. But if I'm not doing that, then I can start to forget lyrics and, and all sorts of stuff. So (laughs) I think that's the way to go. Like I used to get nervous before things and I would just lay in bed and kind of watch TV and obsess about it. And that that's, I've realized that's the absolute worst thing that you can do. Yeah. So now I have a breathing routine and uh, I repeat phrases and I'm, I'm looking at things and prepping things. You got to be like in the zone. Totally. Yeah. And everybody has their own process like that. I mean, I don't think anybody goes on stage or, you know, does any sort of performing thing without having nerves. And I think the more that you do it, the more you realize that you are your own worst enemy. And if you go up and have a good time, that energy is going to translate and people in the room are going to have a good time. If you go up and you're, you know, really nervous, it's like, you're not helping anybody. And you're certainly not helping yourself by overthinking something. It's like, if you screw up, that's awesome. Like people love to be a part of things that don't happen very often. You go up and you forget a lyric, you have to stop a song, start it over. It's like, that's an experience. Everything is an experience, even the mistakes. And and I think that when you're in that mindset and you can just go up and enjoy yourself, it just opens up a whole new world. Yeah, that's a great mindset. And it's true. Like people want a unique experience. They're there with you to be a part of this thing. No one's going to walk away and be like, oh, they didn't play the song exactly right. I hate them now. No one's ever done that. No, not at all. If anything, it's like a really fun moment to share with the crowd. It's like, and it's up to you how you handle that. Like you could break down in tears and run off stage or you can sit there and laugh (laughs) with them and and just talk with the crowd like like you're a human because you are. You know what I mean? Like just have have a conversation with the crowd through the microphone and be like, yeah, hey, if the front row could like, you know, really enunciate the lyrics, that'd help me out because then I might remember them. You know what I mean? Like just- it's it's cool, man. And people have a good time and, and they're going to feed off the energy that you give them. Exactly. So, okay. So you're in Texas now. You're in this band. We're playing gigs. Talk about kind of the process of becoming acclimated to the band and, and getting settled on Rise Records. Now you had a, 
You had, a, a, I think, a full-length and an EP out on Trustkill, yes? Yep. How was your experience on Trustkill? I mean, you joined closer to the end, I think, when they started to have some issues. Did you did you have any, any trouble there? Yeah, totally. I mean, it was mo- mostly the reputation of the label that was hard as a band. You know, like Josh himself, outside of music or whatever, you know, he and I had connected and become buddies. And, and I understand, you know, that like the business part of it was failing in certain aspects and had created a reputation for the label that unfortunately extended to the bands that were on the label. And, and, you know, I think back then, like we just, we were so hungry that we couldn't afford for a label that had a bad reputation to take a toll on us. And I told Josh, you know, I just was like, man, I, we're going to break up or, or you're going to let us go. And we came to a, we came to an agreement and it was good. It was good for us. Um, and it was good for them. And, and we moved on and, by that point, you know, like some damage had already been done with, with all that. And, and so we had to kind of resell ourselves to the industry and, you know, um, the whole rise thing, you know, like there was a lot of people in the industry that just thought that our band was dead in the water, you know, second singer in and having been a part of trust kill and having, you know, gone through so much member changes and all that. It's like, people didn't know if it was still going to be a thing. And, and so we had to go in and make that record and Cameron Mizell who produced it was doing it pro bono until we signed a deal because he believed in the band and without that, I don't know where we would be today. Um, but we, you know, we got in, dove into the record and and started making songs and he started sending them out to people and, and we got the right attention and, and put out songs at the right time and, and, you know, proved everybody wrong. So. Yeah. It, I mean, the determination and the work that you must, you, it has to be, it has to be your life because, you know, between Trust Kill and Rise, I've heard you discuss like the manager dropped you, the booking agent dropped you and labels were like, no, you guys are done. Like that could have easily been it, but you just, you kept going forward and you were focused. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. I mean, like I would say that no one has ever believed in us as much as us, <laughs> you know, like we, we have fought through some of the most gnarly things. I mean, even when I joined the band, the band had like gone through so much and had to like cancel tours and things like that, that there was like this ex- extensive merch debt that, you know, uh, we had to get in and start paying off and we just weren't making anything. We we're living on five bucks a day, eating Taco Bell dollar menu three times a day. We were in that van for five years. I mean, like sleeping in extreme heat, just dying. Cause we couldn't afford to keep the van on with the AC. And it was just like, you know, it was a struggle, but we really felt strongly about what we were creating and, and about, you know, our fans, the people that had paid attention to us and did care about us and getting out in front of them. And we just made it happen, man. We just kept going and, and doing what we did until people paid attention. And honestly, like our band has had a lot of ebbs and flows, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of victories and mistakes. And, you know, like it, it kind of seems like that's, that is our MO. Like, it's like, we have these big highs and these big lows and we just keep pushing. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about some of that. I mean, you said you're living on $5 a day. You're in the van, right? You're you're driving from gig to gig. How do you get beyond that? And what is beyond that? Because I haven't seen past that. Are you in like a tour bus now? Like what is the next level? Yeah. Um, I mean, th- I guess there's a few different forms of transportation, you know, um, that, you know, from the van, the next step up, I think, you know, like with a driver would be, I mean, there's a thing called a rocket ship. Um, it's like a sprinter that has a few bunks in it. Um, and then there's a bandwagon, uh, which is basically a, a little RV built on the back of a box truck kind of vibe. Um, it's, it looks like a semi front, but you don't have to have a CDL to drive it. So anybody can drive you and, um, they're all right. They don't have air rides, so they're really bumpy. Um, but they have a shower, which is amazing and, and bunks and things like that. Um, and couches. Uh, and then, and then you get into the bus world and it's really expensive. I mean, like touring in buses and is an unbelievable expense, but you get to a point with crew members and how much equipment you're traveling with and living on the road so much that it becomes your only option if you want to like really thrive and, and it protects the relationships of the band for sure. Like just, you know, the expense is worth it when you think about how much you're going through living in a van, right? Like it's so hard to protect your voice and to stay healthy and, all of those things. Um, and especially with gas, the way it is now, it's just outrageous. But at the end of the day, man, it's like the money that we spend there, we think about it being for, for our well being. I mean, so that we can continue as a band so we can stay healthy, so we can play night after night after night and, um, and give our fans the show that they deserve. It's worth the expense, but you have to get to the point where, where you have the money to pay for that, you know? Exactly. You mentioned protecting your voice. Do you have to keep yourself isolated to a degree to protect your voice uh, while you're on the tour? To a degree for sure. Yeah. Like if everyone's going out to bars or loud restaurants, like after the show, 
that is way more taxing on your voice than singing and screaming. If you're singing and screaming correctly, you shouldn't be super loud. You should be allowing the microphone to do a lot of the work for you um, in terms of volume. And when you go out to a restaurant and you start talking over the music or talking over a crowd of people, that is so harsh on your vocal cords. And you have to you have to be careful with that. Um, so I do. I, I uh, If I do go out like to eat after the show, I'll write it out on my notepad in my phone and show the the waiter or the waitress or whatever what I want rather than saying it loudly. Um, you know, when I'm home, I feel this like brand new freedom. It's crazy. I start talking really loud and just like, <laughs> you know, like being obnoxious and, and it's, it's great. But when I'm on, on tour, man, I really do. I try to drink a lot of water, get a lot of sleep and not talk too loud. That's, that's the three secrets. Yeah, the the worst is being at a loud bar or restaurant and you have to do the lean in yell to to get people to hear you. I come home from that and I can barely talk. Dude, oh my gosh, man, it's, it is awful on your voice and especially like when you're trying not to get sick on tour because that just ruins things. Um and you know like AC in in bus bunks, it's just like recirculated air. It's just going from one bunk to the other. So if one person gets sick, everyone's going to get it, dude. So you just have to like be courteous and be careful and, and not go places where people are like, you know, spitting on you and sweating on you. You know, it's like, uh, at least for us in our band, we try to, we try to be careful with that as much as we can while, while still wanting people to live their lives. Exactly. Exactly. How much space do you have in the bunk? Like, is it, is it enough space to just like you know, that you're cool and you have your own space. Yeah, 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 for sure. So like, um, I guess I can't really relate it to any other type of bed that you would have slept in unless you like tour in Europe, sometimes like hostels or, or, um, like smaller hotel rooms have these tiny beds, but it's definitely a one person bed. You know what I mean? Like, like think about a twin mattress, like what you slept on when you were a kid in like a smaller room and then cut off a good, like 40% of that. (laughs) That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the new record, Remade in Misery. Yeah. Now, folks, this is out right now on Rise Records. It came out June 3rd, so we have to listen to it. I love the record. Uh, talk about... Now, I've heard you do some other interviews for the record and just kind of the influence that, you went, that went into it, and you talked about rebuilding from the ground up. I mean, talk about some of your personal experience some of what the band has gone through and how that fed into this record. Yeah. I mean, every band was going through it, right? Like the, the pandemic was tough on every band and not being able to tour just it stripped away everything. So all that we had left was the music. And as painful as that was, and as hard of a hit as we took, everybody took, right? It was also really beautiful in a way uh, where we we really got to, you know, they say you have your whole life to make your first record. and that's And that's so true because- as soon as things take off, there's so many voices in your ears and so many just outside experiences, like opportunities and things that, that you need to be doing that, you know, you only have so much time to make a record. So so when we were making a record during the pandemic, we had this ample amount of time where nobody knew when touring was going to start again. So we just, we let the music be all that mattered and just made songs that made us excited. And it, it helped us really rediscover <sighs> who we are as a band and who we are as people and what gave us our start and what our fans really desire from us. You know, like you've got so many people being like, this is what you need to write. And this is the direction you need to go. And this is, you know, and, and, and I will say like rise has always been really great about giving us creative freedom and our management's always been really cool too. It's not necessarily people on our team. It's like other bands that you see being successful in certain ways and other like fan bases that you want to tap into. And, different environments you want to play in different types of touring and everything. You're like, all right, well, we got to sound like this or whatever. And man, we made a lot of mistakes in that way. Just to to be totally honest, like coming back to the making this record and making music that really feels like core roots, Memphis Mayfire. um, It just felt so healthy. It just felt so, it felt like exactly what we're supposed to be. And um, it was really eye opening, man. I mean, it's such a beautiful experience and, and I'm I'm so thankful for the way that it turned out. Obviously, I'm not thankful for the pandemic. I'm not thankful for anybody that lost their life and and all the awful things that people went through with losing jobs and mental health issues and everything. Man, it was terrible. But I think it took that sudden halt for not only for our band but for a lot of people to be able to look intrinsically and say, "What what am I doing right now? And and what is it that I actually want?" So yeah, there was there was a silver lining for us. That's great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I agree with you. You know, of course, there's many bad aspects 
to the pandemic, many lives lost, but it's also changed my life in a lot of great ways. And it sounds like for you and the band as well, you know, being able to put the time and energy into this record and figuring out who you are. And I can hear it. I can hear it. It's focused. It's on point. I love it. I love the whole thing. And, uh, you know, just going through the whole discography, I can hear you experimenting with different sounds and figuring out who you are. And this feels like the focal point. So that definitely comes across. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I mean, it's it's changed how we are going to make records forever, you know, like in the future, things will be different uh, just because of what we learned in this process. And it was really helpful. And yeah, dude, we're, we're so thankful to be where we're at right now. It's a good time to be in Memphis May Fire. And, and I just am, I'm so thrilled with the response that we've gotten and that our fans are connecting with the songs as much as we are. You know, it's really easy when you're in the studio or when you're in a writing process to write something that you're happy with because you created it and you can kind of like understand it and feel it and hear it in a different way than, than anybody else can. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're always doing what you should be doing. Right. It's like you're writing and you're just coming up with wh- whatever feels right in the moment. And you're influenced by so many outside things. Um, sometimes it's really easy just to kind of forget who you are and we had to relearn that and 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 while incorporating a lot of really rad things that we learned along the way i'm not going to say that like you know we had years of just only mistakes it's just that you know we it it felt like we were still all of us but on a path that we didn't envision ourselves ever being on um and now it feels like we're just right back on track and it feels really good man it feels really good that's excellent yeah yeah and i've i've heard you mention in other interviews you know just like the outside voices and being pulled in different directions. Give some examples of that. I mean, did you have pressure from fans or management saying, hey, you should sound like this or you should do that? Or did your personal tastes change where you wanted to try something else? Like what kind of uh, outside forces influenced you? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it can be, you know, the band saying, hey, I, I, I see this thing that I want to accomplish even though it's outside of the realm of what we would usually do. And I want to go that route. I want to try to figure that out. And and then the outside voices come in and say, well, this is how we're going to accomplish that. And you start to take on a shape that's not your own in, in a way where you write differently or you write with people that you haven't written before with before and you, you know, record in, in different places and with different people and you start to look at other bands as like, oh, well, I really love what they've done and and try to not emulate that, but adapt to that in a way to try to play for their fans as well. Because I mean, like we love like all different genres of music and we're so influenced by so many different things that, that we love being a part of, of worlds where we don't necessarily belong. Like we, you know, we did a co-headline tour with Yellow Card and it was something so unexpected. And that was one of the coolest things that we've ever done as a band. I thought it was so awesome because we had very obviously our fans in the room and very obviously Yellow Card's fans in the room and they got into a room together and enjoyed each other and had a good time. And and that was so cool. But you can only take that to a certain extent where you just start to betray like who you actually are and you're wondering if it fits and then your fans can almost kind of just feel it. Like, I don't know if this is what I signed up for almost, right? And yeah, dude, it's like, I'll always be honest about everything that we've gone through as a band because our, our journey is our fans journeys too. And I don't even really like saying the word fans, man, to be honest. I think I'm just kind of like, I just, I do that because I, I've, I hear it so much, but our, our listeners, like our, our family, like the people that give us a reason to do what we do, um, they're just as involved in this as we are. And, and they're the reason why we have an album budget. They're the reason why we have, you know, purpose to write songs. And they're the reason why we can go play shows and, and they're just as much a part of this as we are. Um, and so to, to go in, in the directions that we've gone, you know, like you can just sense the energy that you get back of, you know, is, is this where we should be headed? And, and, with this new record, it's just been such a no brainer that like, man, okay, like we get it, you know, like we can be heavy and still write songs for radio and still go to radio and make that work. And it's so much fun. And we can write our songs that aren't for radio, like very, very blatantly not for radio and go out and and have fun, play those live and connect with a whole different group of people and get into a room and look and look at the crowd and see all these different age ranges of people and, and, different people from different walks of life all coming together. It's such a cool feeling. Um, but that all comes from just being us and not trying to be anything else. Right. And it's, it's gotta be hard to balance, especially for a band like yourselves. You've been around for a long time. Some people have come and gone over the years through the band. There's been a couple member changes and it doesn't sound like any one specific thing. It doesn't just sound heavy. 
It doesn't just sound poppy. It doesn't just sound alt. There's a lot of different elements to this band. And, you know, when some, if someone's like, hey, I want to try to do this, it's like, how do you rectify that? Do you take the whole band in that direction? Do you just decide to do it for a song? I guess, I guess you just have to make the decisions uh, together as a unit. It's tough, man. Yeah. I mean, Kellen and I have always done all the writing for the band, right? So, you know, Jake and Corey are awesome. They're incredible musicians and have been so gracious just with like their roles in the band. And, you know, it's, the, the the truth is, man, like you don't know how something's going to work until you do it and you don't do it until you spend a ton, of, a ton of money doing it and then you do it and then you're done and you're like, okay, this is coming out. You know what I mean? It's not like you, <laughs> it's not like you just go in and experiment with the little amount of time that we have as a band to make a record. Like you go in and you experiment and whatever comes out, comes out. And so you start to just, things get so cloudy and, and sometimes you feel a big win. You're like, Oh my gosh, this song feels so special. And sometimes you get to the end of a song and producers like, Oh, this is a smash. And you're like, is it like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it, (laughs) but when the record's done, the record's done, you know what I mean? And so we learn so much during this process about how we want to make music and, and who we want to listen to and who we don't and who we want to be and who we don't. And, um, it's really cool. Did you ever create something and you weren't crazy about it, but then you came around to it later? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, some of, some of our most successful songs have been instrumentals that start out as started out as me being like, okay, well that's, that's not going to be a single, you know? And then you, <laughs> and, the, and then you finish the song and you're like, whoa, like that, that feels so special. That happens a lot actually, dude. I didn't know, you know, when Kellen had provided the instrumental for, for make believe, I was like, man, this is way out there compared to anything that we would usually do but he's so brilliant. You know what I mean? Like I always try to just, whether I see the vision or not, I try to just respect his brilliance. Um, and I just, we started writing to it and the, and then the instrumental gave me this concept, like this feeling of like uh, hopelessness and, and being lost and feeling like everything is just like a simulation and, and you don't really even know what you're doing in life. And you've gone through so much pain and you just feel disconnected and, and it lent itself perfectly to that. And by the time the song was done, it became one of my, if not my favorite song on the whole record. I love that. Isn't it great when you just, you know, the song intersects with what you're feeling at the time. And that that's just what the song becomes about. Like, I'll write a song with my band and I'll be like, this is what I'm thinking about. Okay, I'm deciding this song is about this. It's just, just the creative process. It's great. It is. It's awesome, man. It's so, it's so cool. And I wrote vocals on this record. Um with my buddy Cody Quistad, who's in a band called Wage War. He's one of my best friends in the world. And we just so happen to live really close to each other and hang out like literally every single day that we're not on tour. And um and and it was so refreshing and and awesome just to to write with a friend and to get his insight from from somebody I really trust that's not trying to just like make dollars, but somebody yeah. that really wants what's best for the band because he grew up listening to the band and he's a fan of the band. And um it's just, it was a really special thing, dude. And especially during the pandemic when writing with other people was like not even on the table for most bands, Cody and I were together every day, no matter what. And so we wrote together and it was so fun, man. It was so cool just to, to see his, his perspective from, from, a, from being a Memphis Mayfire fan as like, well, in this part, I think it'd be awesome if you did this, you know what I mean? Like, you're just like, oh really? Like I wouldn't have gone there. And it's just really cool to, it was awesome. It was an awesome process. Yeah, and you, there must be a, a great level of trust there as well. If you're listening to someone else and deciding like, "Hey, let me try this," and it's maybe it's a little bit outside of what your what your brain is telling you, "Hey, I should be doing this." Dude, totally. And that's every co-write, you know, and our our band hadn't done any co-writing at all until our last album uh Broken, and we wrote we co-wrote every song on that record with the producer. Um and and it's it's nerve-wracking to 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 co-write with someone that you don't know very well. Um, because you don't know if you can be fully like just transparent. Like I know with Cody, dude, we have so much just like video footage and funny stuff from, from the writing process where like my voice is cracking and I'm trying to like go for notes that I could never hit and just like (laughs) trying like new screaming things that I've never done before. And like, even like kind of just like this rappy yelly tone on this record that I've never done before. That's really fun experimenting, like trying that and being like, I wonder what this would be like. And and not having any nerves at all, just being like, if this sucks, we're both going to laugh. And if it rips, we're both going to be so stoked. You know, it's really cool, man. It's an awesome feeling. How do you know 
Maddie, how do you know when it's working? Do you just get a feeling or you hear it back and you're like, this is it? You, you know, like, like the second that it comes out of your mouth, you, you know, um, it either feels really strange and not authentic or it feels like you were in the backyard with a metal detector and found a pot of gold, right? Like it's, <laughs> it, you, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know. I didn't know that I could do that. Or I didn't know that that was what was going to come out. I was going for this and it ended up sounding like this because I'm not actually capable of doing the thing that I thought I was going to do. And then, and then whatever came out is so specific to you and so special. And, and those moments are, are amazing. Oh, that's the best. Plus, if you have other people in the room, you'll know pretty quick if it's working or not. Like everyone has that look on their face, like, yes, or they're all looking at you like, yeah, totally, totally. And Kellen, Kellen is, is a lot more like complimentative of my voice than I am. Um, like he, <laughs> he is always like, oh, that's really cool, man. You should try this. And I'm like, dude, I, you know, I can't do that. Um, and we just kind of go back and forth and it's, it's awesome. Cause I, I think, you know, my band sees more in me than I do. And that's special. And Cody, having grown up on the band and, and loving the band and everything, he he has this whole thing in his mind of of what I'm capable of, and it's just it, dude. It was it was cool, man. I got a lot of confidence back in this record, and um and I guess just kind of like saw a new side of me that I didn't know yet. So yes, and the people have responded. We are number two on uh, the Billboard Hard Music, number three on the Alt Chart, number three on Current Independent Chart, number four on the Rock Chart. I mean, does this blow your mind? It does. It does. And especially because 85% of the album was already out. You wow. know what I mean? Like like nine out of 11 songs had been released. Um, and I am not a mathematician, so that's probably not 85%, but um, <laughs> so, something like that, right? It's like nine out of 11 songs. People knew when they went to go and support this record that they were getting two new songs and that still charted. And we still had bigger numbers than our last full length. Um, I, I just like was blown away by that. That's in the moments when you really say like, oh, wow, we did the right thing. You know, like we, we made the songs that we loved, that our fans love and that, sorry, our friends, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and did something special. That's, it's not like we need big numbers to be happy, but we definitely appreciate knowing that people are like diving in and supporting it and enjoying it, you know? That's great. Yeah. You know, I, I feel you on the fans thing too. Like, I don't like to say fans of the show because I, I don't like to, I don't like to make it sound like I'm elevating myself or right. something. I'm like, oh, we're all in this thing together. Totally. Anybody that's ever met me outside of a show has quickly, quickly realized that I am a very average human being, right? Like I am a very <laughs> normal, scrawny ginger human being, right? And, um, and so it, it, I think it is complete ignorance to try to elevate yourself in that way. And granted, like, obviously like the lights and the smoke and the show, it's like, it's all part of something that people came to experience and they love that. And of course, like the stage is necessary for that aspect of things, but man, yeah. if you want to talk to me or like meet me, you're not going to get what you think you're going to get. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I am the most average person on the planet. Um, and I just love to be a part of what we get to experience with the people that listen to our music. Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing that uh, doing this show has taught me is like, everybody is just people, you know, because I didn't realize that all the musicians I loved growing up were close to my own age. They were just these guys way up on pedestals who I thought were way older than me. But it's like, no, everyone's just doing their thing. We're all creating things and we're just all putting it out there. And that's it. That's it. I mean, honest to God, it's like, you know, there, there are millions of vocalists that are more talented than me. There are millions of musicians that are more talented than, um, than the guys in my band. I mean, you know, we, we all love what we do and we try to master our craft, but you know, I, I would say that the biggest skill set that we have as a band is hard work. And, um, and so just to have this platform, I mean, just to be able to put music out or anybody care and listen to it is a gift and it's not something that we take for granted. That's excellent. Yeah. So how, if you're charting on these different charts, what does that translate to in modern terms? Does that help you in any way? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I'm still getting <laughs> used to it, dude. I don't know. Like, you know, like if you look at our previous like album sales and things like that, it's like, you know, 24, 24,000 albums sold first week translated to a certain chart number. And then on this record, like however many, like 7,000 or whatever it was with, with streams or what, I honestly don't understand how it works, but like that translates to, to a similar chart number now. Right. So it's like, you don't, I don't get it, but I do know that like our streaming numbers are 
triple, quadruple, whatever they have been in the past with this record. And it's been a massive jump in that like realm of things for us. That must feel really good. Like when, you know, before that jump, do you think like, oh, this is it. And I I guess it's just down from here. What's your mindset as you're looking at this stuff? I mean, it's definitely not it because I mean, like it's, it's awesome and we're really stoked and really proud of it. Um, but there's other bands that are, that are like crushing those numbers. You know what I mean? It's like, you see what like rock and metal I think is, is and punk. It's just like pop punk and everything. Right. It's just, it's, it's, people are, are, it's, it's rebirthing right now. It's like, it's a whole thing. Um, this resurgence of, of electric guitar, you know what I mean? It's so rad to, to see. And, uh, I think that the sky is the limit, dude. I think that people's minds and ears are open in a way they haven't been in, in the last like decade. And, it's really cool to see it. It's cool to be a part of it. Yeah, I feel like there is a resurgence, and I hope I'm not imagining that. There's so many excellent bands out doing great things. I, I just feel an energy. I mean, you must see, I guess you're feeling it too. You're out there, you're touring, you're seeing it, you're doing it. Oh, man, absolutely. Yeah, this Dance Gavin tour that we just did, I mean, every show was incredible. And, and you know, our, our pre sale numbers on tickets for this headline tour that we're about to do are some of the biggest that we've had in years and years and years and years. It's just cool, man. It's it's cool to see it. So does the pressure ever get to you? You know, I mean, you're you're playing in front of very large crowds. You're you're charting high with this new record. You're you're at the forefront of this thing all the time. You always have to be on point. Like, what do you what do you do to prepare? What do you do to unwind? That's I mean, that's a it's such a relative question because it, like pressure, you're only as important as you think you are. You know what I mean? Like if you look at a at, at an opportunity and say, "Oh my gosh, there's so many people counting on me," then you're going to feel pressure. If you look at an opportunity and say, "Oh my gosh, I'm so thankful for this and I'm so excited to to see what comes of it," then you're removing the pressure. You know, like I I did not go to every single one of these millions of people listening to our music and put headphones on them and say, "Please support me." Like please like listen to this song. And if you don't like it, I'm crushed. I, I just, we, we made art and we put it out and they're it's spread and people listen to it and they're enjoying it. And it's like, if that continues for a long time, that's rad. And if it doesn't, it's cool. I still, I mean, I was a part of something so special and, and got to experience it. I just like, that's really what it is. And and we all are in that mindset in, in the band. Now, every, every time we walk on stage, we're having fun and we're joking side stage before we go on. And, you know, of course we're warming up and of course we're taking it seriously. And of course we are professionals because that is important. But the pressure of what if I fail is just not there. You know, like we, that that's something that you did to yourself. That's not something that other people put on you, you know, like the, the pressures and the anxieties of live performance and music and everything. It's like, sometimes you'll win and sometimes you won't. And that's cool. And it's like, support the other bands playing as well. Like treat every single band as if they're going to play over you one day. Cause that is going to happen, you know, and go out and treat the people that listen to your music, like human beings, like not like numbers and make rad merch that you would wear yourself and have fun on stage and joke around a little bit. And like, just be you be yourself. Um, when you start to do those things, man, like the pressure just kind of goes away. That's a great mindset. Yeah. I love that. I love that. You know, you're just in it. You're doing what you do and and that's it. I mean, short of you just pulling an Axel Rose and saying, I'm walking off stage and not doing the show, you almost can't fail. Yeah, totally. I mean, man, like, you know, uh, this is going to sound like a really like douchey name drop. I'm not trying to do that. Um, <laughs> but Post Malone, um, he's from Dallas. He, uh, he grew up listening to our band and he had reached out to me on Twitter early on in his career when he was touring with Bieber and everything and was like, we'd FaceTime and talk and he's just so kind and he invited me to come out to the Bud Light dive bar tour that he was doing in Nashville. And we hung out on the bus and just talked. And he's so, so fun. And I watched him play live and he went up and the very first thing he did on stage, he's like, I don't deserve to be here. Like these musicians behind me are way more talented than me. And they started the next song and he forgot the words and, and they had to stop the song and start over. And he's like, see, I told you that they were more talented than me. And everyone in that room had a glow on their face, this smile. Like I think that what people love about him so much is he's so unapologetically authentic And, um, and I admire that a lot, man. I mean, like you do like early on, like you grow up watching these bands and you grow up seeing these musicians and you, and and you have this idea of them in your head, this like larger than life thing. So as soon as your band starts to have some success, you think I have to be that I have to come off as I am larger than life. I have to come off as I am this like, you know, figure on a pedestal. Right. And, um, 
when I started having panic attacks and struggling with depression really bad, my sister, who's a therapist and just an incredible human being, you know, uh, had noticed that I was really inauthentic with our listeners and I was not telling them those things and I was not talking about those things. And she said, the only way you're ever going to get through this is if you're honest with yourself about how you're feeling and you're honest with the people around you. And I started writing about it. You know, our album Unconditional was all about my journey with faith and and my journey with anxiety and depression and and what it was like to go through it and 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 the hope that I had to one day come out on the other side. Um, and that was the was what felt like the first real genuine connection between me and the people that listen to our music. Like to be so vulnerable and to say, I am when you come and you pay a ticket for a ticket to come to a show please don't think that you're going to have some life altering experience because I am something special. We might have a life altering experience together because we're both humans on the same exact playing field, you know, exchanging emotion through music. And that's beautiful. Um, But I am no different than you and I'm hurting the same. And uh, here's a song about it and we can hurt together. I love to hear that. Yeah. So, you know, it sounds like the key to working through a lot of these types of issues is becoming vulnerable. You mentioned dealing with depression and anxiety. And, you know, I struggled with a horrible addiction for many years. And to finally admit that I needed help and then open up to others and surround myself with others and ask for that help, which was the most impossible and hard thing to do in the world. But once I finally started doing that, I was able to work through it. So what what did your process look like? What I mean, besides just writing about it, what what did you have to do to work through that? Man, I, you know, therapy is, was, and ha- has always been and, and will always be so impactful in my life. Um, it's an incredible tool if you have the ability to see a counselor. Um, I recommend it for literally every single person in the world. And, you know, um, talking with friends and family too, like like you said, being vulnerable, being honest and admitting that you need help. Is such a freeing thing. You just, you think that, you know, strength comes from acting like everything's always okay, not only to the outside world, but to, to yourself. Um, and it's just so the opposite of that. We as human beings, I believe we're, you know, not created to be in isolation in our thoughts. I think that we were created to be in community with one another and to share hard things and to share good things. And if you have friends that think that you're a bummer or that you are, a burden to have around because you're struggling and being honest about it. Those aren't friends. And if your family doesn't understand what you're going through, cause they haven't been through it themselves, then find someone else to talk to. You know, um, it's just every single one of us is going to go through this and we didn't learn what to do in high school, you know? And, and I don't mean like everyone's going to experience anxiety and depression, but on some level, everyone will experience things where they have to admit that they can't do it alone and that they have to reach out. And that's vital to the human experience. That is a vital part. We have to talk about things that are scary to talk about and admit things that are scary to admit. And I'm still doing that on a daily basis. And it's it's the only way that I survive. Same here. I think it's important to find the right audience and venue to do it in as well. Like I used to just get loaded and go to a bar and unload on some poor suspecting stranger. And that's that's not the right outlet. You know, I have to be surrounded with like-minded people and I don't know, people who understand what I'm going through and can help me with what I'm going through. Oh man, totally. Substance is just so easy to go to because it does make you feel better in a moment. And when, when you get to a point where you realize that the substance is becoming an even bigger issue than the issue you were trying to cover up, man, it's dangerous, such a slippery slope. And you just, it's so hard to get away from, but yeah, I would just, I would encourage anybody like if, if you are using substances, um, to just try to find an alternate alternate path, something healthy, you know, like devote yourself to something that will make you proud and try to find self-discipline and talk to people and, and ask for help because those things are so rewarding. And the, the lies that we believe as humans, the, you know, the desire to always be on cloud nine and, and to always be seeking pleasure, you know, it's not what satisfies the human brain. Pleasure, extensive amounts of pleasure is really frustrating for the human brain. It's, um, it's peace that the human brain actually desires. And um, and we're not going to find it in substance. And we're not going to find it in lying about how we feel. Um, we're going to find it in being honest and, and trying to find real, real hope and real healing. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I say this all the time, the answers are out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to find the right combination of whatever it is that works for you. Uh, meditation, yoga, 
find your thing, stick with it, and and you can feel better. You know, it's like I didn't realize uh, you're not supposed to feel like you're on multiple drugs all day, every day. That's not natural. That's yep. not human. You, you know, you're going to crash and burn. Yep, a hundred percent. I mean, you can feel better. You can be better. Like true joy, freedom, happiness, relief. Those things are real and they're right in front of you. And it sucks to put in the work for something that you never asked for in the first place, but it's worth it. Life is beautiful. If you're willing to see it, life is so beautiful. Relationships are so beautiful. People are so beautiful. The media and the internet is confusing and lying to people all the time. The world is not just utter chaos. Of course, there's terrible things happening. It's always been that way. But there's beautiful moments right in front of you. What you are able to handle, what you can comprehend, and the people that you can love and be loved by and the community that you can invest in is right around you. Do that. Change your environment. Change the people that you're around and change the things that you're letting enter your mind because you don't have to be sad. Exactly. Like uh, we can only control so much. Like I'll be on Twitter, right? And someone will be like, oh my God, this thing is happening. The world is going to end tomorrow. And I start to get anxious and I'm like, wait, stop. All right, let's close Twitter. Uh, Even if this is true, uh, I myself, Keith, am not going to be able to fix it today. So let me see what's around me that uh, I can do. Yeah. And what's actually happening in in your immediate environment? Like if you need to go to war, you're going to go to war. If you're going to need to uh, you know, go and, and whatever, dude, like what, what's happening right in front of you. And are there world issues that you can do things about and help? Absolutely. Absolutely. Getting on Instagram or Twitter and ranting about it does not help. And, uh, what can you do in your immediate community? You know, what, what can you do in, in your life? What can you, what changes can you make in your life that would better the world? Um, those are things that you have control over and you just don't be, um, lied to about what you're actually capable of holding and and make sure that you're taking in good news as much as you're taking in bad if you have to see the bad. Absolutely. So Maddie, you have your own pomade. I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I've always been fascinated by um, just barber culture in general. Like I, I love going to the barber and having the full experience and, you know, I have a lot of re- really great friends that are barbers and we bring a barber on tour with us. His name's Mikey. And, um, I just love that world, that trade. If I wasn't doing music, I would try to be good at that <laughs> because I, I, I really do love it. And, um, I like to stay sharp, you know, it's, I think that the way that you, um, take care of yourself and, and the way that you look can really help you feel better in general. And so I, I put effort into that and, I could definitely be better at fitness, but as far as hair product, um, I'm, you know, like I do like those things and, and I had a few products that I liked, but nothing that was really perfect. And in 2016, um, you know, 2014 to 2016, I started just developing my own formula and started this brand called on point pomade and, and, uh, launched it in 2016. People all over the world use it and love it, man. It's such a blessing. You know, we, we do uh, a premium, uh, pomade that is a very versatile product. Apply it to your hair wet and blow dry it through for more of a natural look or apply it to your hair when your hair is dry for more of a shine uh, and stronghold look. Um, and we have a beard oil as well that's uh, a blend of different really rich oils and, and our signature fragrance. And and it's just a it's a really fun, cool thing to do that's an outlet for me outside of music. And I've always kind of had like an entrepreneurial mindset and I like to to do things that I, you know, share things that I like with other people. And and it's been really cool to see how many people like it. I love that. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm into fashion. I like to look good. Uh, I pay a lot to get my hair cut at a legit place. So I'm totally with you on that. I don't use product anymore because I got like a long thing going on. But who knows, that could change at some point. But I love this. How do you how do you make your own formula? Because when I was using product, I tried a million different ones. And then, uh, you know, then I could only get this one that I could only get on Amazon. So I bought a whole bunch of it to have it on hand. How do you develop your own formula? How do you do it? Well, I definitely couldn't have done it by myself. You know, um, I had a business partner when starting the company and he helped me find a scientist in Oregon that um, I went back and forth with a lot. Just, you know, sharing different products I loved, but the things that I didn't like about them and just trying to find the perfect thing. And what I really wanted was a water soluble pomade, not a petroleum based pomade, something that washed out easy, but still held really strong like a petroleum base. And so we just went back and forth on so many versions before we landed on, on the one that we really liked. And you know, and then, and then outsource for manufacturing. Cause we, you know, when we manufacture, we make 10,000 units at a time. And so there's no way that I was going to be doing that in my kitchen. Right. Um, <laughs> we wanted a really legitimate lab to be doing it and everything. And so, yeah, it's a, it takes a, it takes a whole team. Wow. So how does the process work? Like they send you a, uh, they send you a sample and you try it and you're like, no, add more of this. And yeah. then they, it's back to the drawing board. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, like this, 
this, uh, you know, the way that it solidifies in my hair, I don't like it. Or the way that, um, it washes out feels weird. Or, you know, like when I put it into wet hair, it seems to just dissolve rather than, you know, kind of stay firm and, um, all those things. It's like, there's a million different ways you can make hair product. And, and this one was just perfect for me. And, and it somehow it's perfect for a lot of people. So. That's excellent. So you must be pretty well set up between the band. You've got a solo career going. You've got the palm made. I mean, uh, things are happening. You're not just living on $5 a day anymore, I hope. Right? I mean, man, you know, everything is always a, a work in progress. That's for sure. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for, for the most part, you know, I've, I've been really fortunate to, uh, to do things that I, that I love and, and to put a lot of effort into it and then have it be supported by people that, um, you know, enjoy the music or enjoy the products or whatever. And it's been really cool. That's the thing I've learned, Maddie, over the years is you're only going to get as much out of it as you put in. Like I used to sit around and think, oh, the right situation is going to present itself or someone is going to see how talented I am and and pluck me out of uh, obscurity. But no, you have to create your own life. You have to do it yourself. Yeah. no, Nobody wants you to win as much as you want to win. And there's no handouts in the world. And if there is, then it's uh, most likely too good to be true. Exactly. No one is ever going to put the amount of effort into your thing as you. No doubt. No doubt, man. So let's talk about what we've got coming up. Now, folks, we know that Remade in Misery is out. We have to listen to it. We have to purchase it. I mean, if you have not heard it yet, go out and do it today, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, please uh, listen to the record, no matter how you get it. If you want to purchase it, that's awesome. You know, we're honored. Um, if you don't have the money, please go and, and just listen to it on a streaming service or steal it or whatever. I just want people <laughs> to hear the music, you know, like we're so thankful to have been a part of this record and, and, uh, for it to be out now, you know, two years later, if you have the means to support it, we are eternally grateful. And you've got a U.S. tour kicking off in a couple of days. Yes. Yes. Um, we are starting the remade and misery tour, which is presented by Sirius XM Octane, uh, we're bringing out From Ashes to New, Rain City Drive, and Wolves at the Gate, and we are going all over the country. So please check out the dates at memphismayfire.com and uh, come and hang out for what I believe to be our best live show yet. Thank you, Maddie. You know, I, I love the record. I love the band. I love what you're doing. So just keep doing what you're doing. You know, it was a, it was a real pleasure speaking with you. Yes, likewise, likewise, man. Well, thank you for having me, and I hope to see you out there. There you have it, folks. Maddie Mullins. That was an excellent conversation. I love the band. I love the new record. I love everything they're doing. You know, hearing his story and just how he was so focused on what he wanted to do from such an early age, I thought that was really inspiring. He took the chance to audition for Memphis May Fire. He took a chance moving down to Texas to work with the band full time and become a member of the band. I, it just goes to show you that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And he took risks and they paid off. And you heard it in the conversation, you know, he and the rest of the members of this band have put an unbelievable amount of work into this band over the years and they've overcome a lot. So I'm really happy that the new album, so I'm really happy that the new album Remade in Misery is doing so well. And I wish Maddie and the rest of the band continued success and good fortune. Excellent conversation. Thank you again, Maddie. You know, as I was editing this thing, at times he really reminded me of Anthony Green. They have a similar speaking voice and kind of a similar story too. Similar to how Maddie auditioned for Memphis May Fire and then went out there to start performing with them without even really knowing them. Anthony did the same thing with Sayosin when he moved out to California after he joined that band. So I saw some parallels there. So that was just a, a little observation. All right, so let's check in, folks. How are we doing? I'm doing great. I did have a COVID scare last week, though. I was around somebody who had COVID. I didn't know they had it. And then they let me know later. So I took a home test. I've got a bunch of home tests here. Came up negative. So thankfully, I don't have COVID. And as far as I know, I haven't had it yet. I'd like to not get it, but I was thinking about it and I've decided I'm going to keep wearing a mask in certain indoor spaces and on the subway or whenever I feel like it until the third anniversary of this podcast. 
Now, those of you who have been with us since the beginning, you know that this podcast kicked off right around when COVID was kicking off and all the shutdowns and everything else. So, I mean, it's never safe, I guess, but I just decided I'm going to definitely wear the mask until year three. And maybe I'll keep going even after that. Who knows? But I don't want the virus. I don't. But it seems like it's inevitable that everybody's going to get it at some point. I'm very happy that I've got the gaming YouTube channel up and running. It's something I've been thinking about for a long time. And it's here now. It's here now. I spent all day Saturday doing that and making the first YouTube video. Uh, As you know, I'm passionate about gaming. So I'm happy to be on Twitch and doing live streams and putting out a little bit of gaming content out there as well. Because, you know, I watch a lot of gaming content creators and Twitch streamers. So it's nice to be a little part of that community and be putting some of my own stuff out there as well. I might have to redo that first YouTube video that I put up because there's a copyright thing with the song I'm using in there. But the creator says apparently anyone can get licensed to use it. So I'm waiting to see. I'm going to see what happens, but it just might be uploaded and changed a little bit. Uh, But there's definitely more content coming. I have other games that I finished on Twitch and other Warzone content that I'm going to be putting up there. So if you haven't subscribed to the gaming YouTube channel, check it out. It's linked in our Clips channel and our main YouTube channel. And I've been watching more TV and movies lately because by Sunday night, I just get burnt out on gaming and I can't take any more. I watched the movie Philadelphia for the first time. I really loved that. I got all caught up on Better Call Saul. Are you watching this? Have you seen this? Unbelievable show. I mean, really. I just finished season five. I know that they're most of the way through six. I think they still have to air the end of season six. I'm actually going to buy AMC Plus or whatever that streaming service is called so I can finish it because I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait two years for it to come on Netflix. I think I'm going to get rid of Netflix too because I never watch it. I literally only watch it for Better Call Saul and I could use the extra $20 a month. Believe me. Work is going okay. Life is going okay. I'm enjoying summertime. I'm enjoying sitting in front of my windows with the windows open and the cool summer breeze coming through the air. And this past weekend, I had dinner with some friends. My friend was celebrating not just his birthday, But one year drug free. That's one full year free of mood and mind altering substances. So I was really happy that my friend is doing well and has made it this far away from drugs and alcohol. And, you know, I hear these stories every week. The the things that people come back from, the turmoil that they manage to leave behind, the changes they make in their life. It's great. So I'm very happy for my friend, and I'm very happy for anybody out there who manages to change their life in that way. You know, I did it. It's not something that I ever thought I could do, and you've heard me talk about it on the show plenty, but very often I look back at my life and what it was compared to what I'm doing now, and I'm just eternally grateful that I have the life I do now. I'm doing everything that I want to do and more all the time now. So if you're out there and you're struggling, there's help. There is help. You just have to find the help that works for you. So that's it for this week, folks. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'm going to be here every single Monday morning and sometimes twice a week. We've got an all-star lineup of guests coming. We've got more exciting guest co-hosts. The excitement never stops here at the new scene. So we're back next week with a new episode and a new guest. So thanks everybody for listening, and until next time.